Good morning. Today is uh, Wednesday, 26th of May, 2021. I think in my last video I wrote it Thursday, so maybe I'm moving forward in time. In any case, this is a Wednesday, May 26th, 2021. <clears throat> And this is uh, physics K3, the, our continuation of statistical mechanics, chapter eight, this is lecture four. And in this one, I'm gonna describe the Fermi-Dirac statistics, the Fermi-Dirac distributions, you know. So this distribution, Fermi-Dirac distribution holds for fermions, as you know, as we said last time, and we are concerned with the distribution of the fermions across the energy levels for a system that contains n particles in thermal equilibrium at an absolute temperature T. And fermions, as we discussed last time, uh, they obey Pauli's exclusion principle. That is, each particle can occupy only one quantum state. <clears throat> And fermions, as we know, these are identical particles and they are indistinguishable. And because they are indistinguishable, swapping them in between the energy levels is not considered to be a different arrangement. For example, in, in Maxwell-Boltzmann, we said, if it, this is my energy E1 and this is some higher energy, if I swap, let's say it's a particle A, that's particle B. If I swap them, so particle A now has a higher energy and particle B has a lower energy, that is considered to be a different arrangement, a different uh, combination, permutation or whatever. But in this case, you know, there is no particle A and there is no particle B. Uh, if they switch, uh, you know, they're identical and they're indistinguishable, so that doesn't really um, change the energies, you know. So we are going to consider this swapping over here. So <clears throat> in any case, uh, what did I say? Yeah, that's what I said over there. So energy levels, again, you know, we're going to fix the energy level. So here I have drawn, that's my energy level E1, and it has particle N1 particles. And it's got, the number of the states is U1 at energy level E1. I should have written epsilon, but I keep on changing my um, notations. And that's a higher energy level E2, which got N2 particles, and the number of the states for this energy level is E2, and so on and so forth. And we have R energy states, energy levels, the number of the particles is R, and the number of the states over here is GR, over here. So number of the states, the states I have shown here, uh, shown here as these cells, you know. And these are the particles, and we are assuming that the number of states is much larger than the number of the particles, you know, that's what we are assuming. <clears throat> so you have only one particle in one cell because of the Pauli's excluding principle, you know. <clears throat> now I want to permute I want to switch these particles at a given energy level in different states, you know, rather than this way. So, and I want to find out, so basically, you know, this is, sorry, let me just go back a little bit. So this is one macro state, as we had just said for the uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that I have n1 particles, n2 particles, and so on and so forth. Now, with different number of particles, let's say n1 minus 2 and n2 plus 2, blah, 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 that would be another macro state. And there could be so many macro states, you know. <clears throat> and, but we are looking for the macro state with the maximum number of the micro state. And here the micro state is defined by switching these particles into the different states this way, you know, not that way. So that's what we are looking for. So basically we are looking for this distribution, Ni, you know, 
by maximizing the number of the microseeds, just like we did before. So how do you permute these particles into these states, you know? So let me consider, let me say, okay, I'm going to take an energy level EI, one of these energy levels, somewhere here, let's say EI. And that energy level has, let's say, Ni particles, and it has GI states, you know, that is GI cells. So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, okay, Ni particles, I'm going to assume, I'm going to say that, you know, I have, I have two kind of objects now. I have Ni objects, that is, this particle is sort of attached to this guy, this bar over here. You know. And then, so this is my occupied state. I'm just denoting it by this particle, which is just sort of glued, let's say this bar is glued to this one. And then the empty state, so this would be occupied state. And then the empty state would be, the empty state would be GI minus NI. Because GI is the total number of the states, NI is the number of the particle in that state, so GI minus NI would be the vacant states, you know. And those vacant states I'm denoting by just this bar. So I'm saying, okay, I got two types of objects. One type of object that looks like this, kind of a ball connected to this bar, and GI minus NI objects, just like a simple bar, you know. And I want to just permute and find different combinations of this thing, you know. So first of all, the total number of the objects that I have just like we had done, you know, total number of books or total number of particles, or we, we have done this thing before, you know. So the total number of the objects over here that we want to shuffle is Ni plus Gi minus Ni, that is equal to Gi. That's my total number of the objects, you know. So first thing would be, so the number of the combinations, sigma i or omega i, or whatever you call this guy, that is for the ith, ith energy state, uh, for the ith energy level, is going to be factorial of this. But we have to divide out these two because this is one type and this is one type. These are all identical, these are all identical. And we know from the past, you know, how we deal with these things. So this is one type and this is another type. This is identical, these are, and these are identical to this. So we're going to divide it by GI minus. Ni objects which are ident identical factorial of that, and this Ni, you know, and that's how you get your this thing over here. So this is for the I energy level. Now same thing I can do. So I can start with this one, then I can go to this one, and I can calculate this uh, omega i equal to omega one, omega two, omega three. I can just use this thing for everyone. And the total number of the arrangements for all the energy levels, the entire system, for this particular macro state is going to be omega. That's going to be a multiplication for, of all these. So it's going to be omega n1 plus omega n2 plus omega nr. I mean, not plus multiplied by, sorry. So basically, you know, this guy will be your g1 factorial divided by n1 factorial multiplied by G1 minus N1 factorial. And this, this combination will be G2 factorial divided by N2 factorial multiplied by G2 minus N2 factorial, and so on and so forth. So this will go all the way up to the last energy level. You know. <clears throat> so the omega, the multiplicity, multiplicity of the entire system is going to be a product of all these and you know by now that it's going to be uh, omega i and this is a big pi, pi means you know it's just the same for sigma except it's multiplication there equals summation you know. So that would be your gi factorial divided by gi minus ni factorial multiplied by ni factorial. And that's, that's what you have written over here, I've written here. Now, we, so this is, this is the number of combination, or the multiplicity, or the number of the microstates for this particular macrostate that I have chosen with N1, N2, N3, so on and so forth. But I want the one where 
this would be maximum here. So just like before, I'm going to maximize it. So we're going to maximize this omega. And we said it's more convenient to maximize ln of omega rather than omega itself. You know. <clears throat> it's going to give you the same result. Wherever the maximum of this is, same place the maximum of ln of omega system would be. So I take the log, the ln of this guy. So if I take ln of this thing, it's going to be ln of this quantity plus it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a multiplication. So if I take ln of this, ln of this, plus ln of this, plus so on and so forth. Right? So that's why I have the summation sign over here for all the elements. And this, then I open this thing, you know, you know, that log ln a divided by b is ln a minus ln b. So that's what I've used over here. And then you're going to sum it because of these multiplications, you know. So I have ln of gi factorial minus ln of ni factorial minus ln of this guy. Again, you're applying here, you know, this is your uh, multiplication and division using logarithm. You, you, you know those uh, principles, you know. So that's what I did basically over here. <clears throat> so there is a ln of gi factorial minus ln of ni factorial and minus ln of gi minus ni factorial. That's what I got. Now I'm going to use the Stirling formula as I did. Let me just check the count. Alrighty. Looks like it's going to be a short video. That's good. <clears throat> so I'm going to use the Stirling formula just like we did before for a large number of particles that holds good. Um, ln of x factorial equal to x, ln of x minus x. So that's what we can apply for all these quantities, you know, this, this, and this, all these elements which have factorials because we want to get to factorial. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, all right. So I have, so I'm going to apply this, so this will be your GI, ln of GI minus GI, that's just this uh, Stirling formula. And this minus sign I'm going to take and factor it out, and this minus sign I'm going to factor it out. And then I have again here NI, ln of NI minus NI is over here, and this minus sign I took out, so this is going to be your GI minus NI, ln of GI minus NI, minus GI minus NI. So this minus GI and what is it? Yeah. So this minus GI becomes plus GI, that's going to cancel with this GI. And this is plus NI over here, that's going to cancel with this minus NI. So I'm left over with a summation sign of uh, GI, ln of GI, minus NI, ln of NI, and then you have minus sign over here, minus GI, minus NI, multiplied by ln of GI minus NI. That's what we get. And this is a constant quantity over here. <clears throat> and uh, this is a constant quantity. And uh, so now we maximize it, just like we maximized uh, earlier. Um, so that's my delta. With respect to delta NI, I'm going to maximize it. So I get delta ln of omega, and that, then I'm going to set it equal to zero. And that's what I did over here. So delta of this guy is going to be zero because GIs are fixed quantities, you know? And then you have this thing over here. 
So here I have, here I have minus I, delta Ni, N of Ni, and then you're going to have this Ni and delta of uh, Ln of Ni that will give you 1 over Ni just 7. <laughs> so I took the delta of this and I set it equal to zero. And uh, so this one was zero over here. This one already we did. So this ni and I, you know, is going to cancel over here. And then I have this minus sign. And the same thing I'm going to do over here. So here I have, so if I take delta of this, that will be your minus delta ni because delta of this will be zero. And that's going to give you, and this is the second function, so it remains like this. And then I have this gi ni, and this will be delta of this. Delta of this will be 1 over gi minus ni. And this is a constant, so it's delta will be 0, and you're going to get minus delta ni. So this gi minus ni and gi minus ni cancels. You have minus delta ni remaining over here. And this minus delta ni becomes plus. And that's going to cancel with this delta ni because this ni and i cancels over here. So we have, what do we have left? Then we have, so, so we have left, left this term and this term. And so this is delta ni, ln of gi minus ni, and minus delta ni, ln of ni. So you just divide it, so this will become delta ni, you take it out, and it's going to be ln of gi ni divided by ln of, divided by ni. This is just your log a divided by b equal to log a minus log b. So that's what we have used over here, equal to zero. That's my equation number one. So this is my maximization equation, where I have maximized this thing. And now my constraints, the two constraints are again just like before. The total number of the particles constant, that is summation of ni equal to capital N. And if I take delta of this, delta of N will be zero. And delta, you can take it inside, that means summation of delta ni has to be zero. <clears throat> Similarly, the total energy is summation of Ni Ei, and that means delta E, because E is a fixed quantity, so that will be zero. And again, you can take delta of this, so that will be Ni delta Ei plus Ei delta Ni. But delta Ei is zero, because Ei is constant, so you have only this term remaining. So this will be your Ei delta ni, ei delta ni, and delta i taken outside in the summation sign, that's what you get. This ei is fixed as I said. <clears throat> so basically this boils down to, yeah, so this boils down to, um, I've just written it like that, ei delta ni equal to zero. So these are my two constraints, you know, just this we have done last time also. So these, I'm going to maximize that thing with this, you know, keeping in mind these two constraints. And the way we do it, we use a Lagrange method of undetermined multipliers, okay? So that is, we're going to maximize, we're maximizing this error of Omega system with constraints two and three, just like we did for the maxwell Boltzmann. And the way I do it is that I'm going to take the minus of equation number one. You know, you can choose it any way you like. Uh, minus, this is the, you know, this is the, I'm just going to take, before we had added or something, you know, I'm going to take minus of this because this is zero anyway. So you take minus or plus, doesn't matter. So minus of equation one, and then I'm going to introduce these two constraints, constraints by multiplying equation number two with alpha and the constraint number three, the second constraint, which is given by 
equation three by beta and set it equal to zero. And then I'm gonna find out the, these undetermined coefficients afterwards, you know. So if I do that, then my equation number one is just summation sign, and I have said minus sign over here, n and of gi minus ni divided by ni. This delta ni I have to get outside over here. And this one is true, delta ni alpha, alpha is right here, and the other one is beta ei, and delta ni I have to get over here. So that's my, this, from this equation I get this. Now once again, just like we did in the Maxwell-Boltzmann, you know, you, you know, you, this will be equal to zero, if this is zero, or this is equal to zero. And to guarantee that this sum equal to zero, that means we want each term to be individually equal to zero. That will just guarantee it. So, <clears throat> we require that minus ln gi minus ni divided by ni plus alpha plus beta ei, we're gonna set it equal to zero. Now remember, once we do that, this ni, it corresponds to the maximized macro state now. I should have represented these ni by a different variable, but it's understood that these ni's now correspond to the maximized macro state, you know. It's not the original one now. So then this guy gives me, what does it give me? Okay, so I have written here ln of gi minus ni divided by ni, and I took this on the other side equal to alpha plus beta ei. So this gi minus ni divided by ni, that becomes equal to e to power alpha, e to power beta i, they just add up, you know. And so I written this break into fractions, so gi by ni minus one, and minus one goes on the other side, that becomes plus one. So this is gi divided by ni equal to one plus e alpha e to the power beta ei. Now, but we want ni number of particles per state, so you reverse it. So your ni divided by gi, that's gonna become one over one plus e alpha e beta ei. And that's my Fermi Dirac distribution though that you give me the energy uh, energy of the level and I'm gonna tell you how many particles are there in one per state, you know. And you know, like last time we had I identified that this beta equals one over kt and I'm gonna send you this thing in a WhatsApp or something, how you relate these two. <clears throat> so once again, uh, this is for the discrete energy levels and everything. But when we have continuous rather than discrete distribution of energies, then we know that G, E, we just take it G, E, D, E. So this will be the number of the states between E and E plus D, E, that is my, you know, G. So I'm gonna forget about this E, I over here, and with this understanding, I'm gonna write it, Fermi Dirac distribution at energy E, where E lies between E and E plus D, E equals to one over, now what did I do here? Oh, sorry. So now I did one thing more. So this alpha, I'm gonna use, substitute alpha equals to, let me just take the cap. Okay, we're good. So, I'm gonna just, alpha equal to minus EF divided by KT, where EF we call the Fermi energy. I'm just gonna make the substitution over here. So the Fermi Dirac distribution becomes one, and this alpha is your minus EF divided by KT, and this is your E, and E divided by KT, because beta is your one over KT. So it becomes one over one plus e to the power e minus ef divided by kt. So that's my Fermi Dirac distribution. Now to understand the significance of this ef, what is this ef? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to consider a system of fermions, and you know we are dealing with fermions at absolute zero t t equal to zero. They are at absolute zero, that is capital T equal to zero. At that temperature, we're going to consider the system. 
and we're going to consider the occupancy of the state, which is the FD, whose energies are less than EF and greater than EF. That means there are two cases, so absolute zero, T is at absolute zero, and we're going to consider when the energies of the states are less than this EF, whatever it is. So if I write it like this, so if E is less than EF, E is less than EF, so it's going to be a negative quantity. So when T equal to zero, it becomes minus infinity. And E to the power minus infinity is zero, so it is one. So at absolute zero, all the states up to EF, they're all occupied because it is one. And remember, in Fermi direct statistics, it cannot be more than one because there is only one fermion per state. That's Pauli's exponent principle restricts that. So it cannot be greater than one. So that makes sense, you know. <clears throat> so you get the idea now that at absolute zero, what's going to happen is all the states below EF are filled. And what happens at absolute zero when E, when the energy is slightly greater than EF? Then I can write it E minus EF divided by KT, and this is a positive quantity now. So this would be E to the plus infinity, because this is a positive sign, and this would be zero. That means at absolute zero, all the states above EF, they're all empty, and it's going to look like this. Here I have my Fermi derived distribution as a function of E, that's my EF. So all the states below, the occupancy is full, they're all one. And all the states above this, they're all zero. <clears throat> so to summarize this thing, uh, at absolute zero, all energy states up to EF are occupied and none above. Above this, all they're empty. You know. If the system contains n fermions, we can calculate the Fermi energy EF by filling up its energy states with the n particles in order of increasing energy starting from e equal to zero. You start filling it up, right? <clears throat> then the highest state to be occupied will then have to be E equal to EF. So that's how we can calculate your EF, you know, we still start filling it. Now, this was at absolute zero. Now, if T is slightly greater than absolute zero, and t is a little bit more greater than zero. So if t is greater than zero, then what's going to happen is that some of the fermions very close to the f, they're going to have enough energy to jump over 